I made $90,000 off of a $16 t-shirt. I'll tell you that story tonight. All right? So why the heck aren't you people wearing these t-shirts? You don't have to wear this one. Go get, go get one for yourself. Do you believe me? I made $90,000 off this t-shirt? 425 South Warminster Road in Hatboro. I'm wearing my t-shirts at the gym. You want to know why the gym's a great place to wear your t-shirts? Because nobody can talk to each other. They all got earbuds in, right? They're all trying not to get caught staring at the pretty girls. And they're working on their physique, right? But they're not trying to conduct any business. You got 150 people in some of these gyms. Right? If you go to Edge, there's like 250 people there. And um, I work out at LA Fitness. And I can guarantee you that, okay, so you might have seen the red BMW outside, which Eric is driving because I sold it to him, right? But I used to park my red BMW right out by the front door of LA Fitness. And then I would wear the t-shirts with a picture of me and the cars and the truck on it, right? So everyone in the damn gym knows what business I'm in. For $16 a t-shirt, I bought 10 of them, $160 investment. Everyone in my gym knows what I do for a living, even if I never even talk to them, all right? So this couple came up to me. This was last year when Hurricane Irma hit. Was that like, was uh, September maybe? September, October? You know the exact date? Yeah. Oh, that's impressive. Okay, okay. I didn't know you were a public adjuster. Uh, so um, basically, this couple came up to me and said, you know, uh, we're, they had told me about six months prior to Hurricane Irma that, um, that uh, they were thinking of selling mom's house. Mom is, uh, I think she was like 92. And um, she had made the decision that she was going to finally move out of her house and move into a retirement community. So I went, so they had mentioned it to me about six months prior. And when Hurricane Irma hit, I knew the house was in a flood zone, right? I knew that because that whole area floods, in, if you know where 425 South Warminster Road is, right? There's a huge apartment building there with like hundreds of units and that whole place floods. So I knew about it. So, uh, when Hurricane Irma hit, I called them up, <clears throat> and uh, they said, you know what, we've had it, we're ready, right? They, they have a, a full basement, might be like, it's pretty high ceilings, it might be like 11 foot high ceilings in the basement there, and they said that the water came three inches away from the main floor of the house. So it was crazy, the whole basement, the basement took on all the water, and then all the water just dissipated on its own, right? Ruined the water heater, ruined the heater, but they had flood insurance, so they got brand new water heaters and heaters, and I'm the one buying the house. I, I, I went to visit them at the house. I didn't see that the basement was filled. They just told me about it, right? But while I was there, they're like, don't worry about the water heater and the heater because we got flood insurance and it's going to be replaced in the next two weeks. I'm like, great, got a brand new heater, brand new water heater, not a bad deal, right? So they, the sellers, was the daughter of the 93-year-old woman and her husband. And real nice people. And I came in and I looked at the house and I said, I usually, when I go to look at a house, the first thing I do, I walk around the outside of the house, then I go inside, I walk around the inside. And what I'm typically trying to do is calculate in my head approximately how much money does this house need, right? So this house was old and outdated, kitchen cabinets, everything was outdated. But it was clean and it all worked, right? And you, it was literally ready to move in tomorrow, today. Somebody could have just moved in. <clears throat> so I started the bidding at 120 grand. Uh, she got, she pushed the numbers up to, I believe, 145, which was still a heck of a bargain. 
This is a neighborhood in Hatboro where the houses are selling for 300 grand, right? So uh, there was, if I tell you that I fixed nothing, I mean, I took out some trash and, and got rid of it. I never turned a screwdriver. I never did anything to the house, right? Uh, there was a loose doorknob. I may have tightened it. <laughs> it might have taken me 10 seconds. And um, I thought to myself, so I agreed to pay 145 I, I went home. I took a bunch of pictures of the property. I went home. I put the house up for sale on the MLS. I think it was 245 I put it up for. And, you know, a lot of people know it's in a flood zone, so I, I didn't want to get crazy with it. <clears throat> and I just sold the house on the MLS. I didn't get a full $100,000 because I had to pay closing costs and title and stuff like that. I had some cost uh, to buying the house. But I made 90 grand off of it. And I didn't do anything. I didn't do any work. 425 South Warminster Road, totally in a flood zone. When you look at this house, if, uh, <clears throat> if you look it up on your phone or something, you'll notice there's no house next to it on the left. There's no house on the right. And there's no house in the rear of it because all three of them were demolished by FEMA. So this is a major, major flood zone, right? And it's, I'm glad that FEMA didn't demolish this one because... <laughs> They approached me over a silly T-shirt that cost $16. You got to be crazy not to have these, get a T-shirt, get a button, get a hat that says I buy houses. Let the world know what you do. I'm, I'm not a genius. This is lucky. I'm wearing these damn T-shirts for, I've been a member of LA Fitness Gym for 25 years. Uh, and I wear these T-shirts almost every day to the gym. I have like 15 of them, so it's not like I'm going to run out. Uh, what a super simple, easy way to make money. It's just like when you wrap a car like this, right? I was the first one I bought this. I bought a Nissan pickup truck, and I wrapped it. This is actually a picture of Larry's truck. Uh, but And I bought this Beamer and wrapped it. I got so much attention from this, right? The first year I bought a truck and wrapped it, uh, I didn't get a lot of phone calls in the first year. Or I did get a lot of phone calls, but nobody was serious about selling me their house. The second year, the phone calls seemed to drop off a cliff. This is the second year I had the truck, a black truck like this, but it was a Nissan. And then the third year, I got a phone call from this couple. <clears throat> the guy had had a heart attack. His house was in terrible, terrible shape right on Jacksonville Road in Warminster. Went to look at his house, it was really wasted. And when I looked at it, uh, the guy offered to lower the price for me if I would buy him a condo in a development called Hampton Crossings. Anybody know where that is? You know where the Dunkin' Donuts is at the corner of Street Road and Huntington Pike? Anybody know that? If you went behind the Dunkin' Donuts, uh, there's a road that takes you to County Line Road. But if you go the other way, right where you, you have your two houses, Hampton Crossings is a development over there. And they said they didn't have the money to fix up their house, right? But they would lower the price for me. So I think they lowered the price for $30,000 $30, for me. And I turned around and I wholesaled it to a guy. Um, it was years ago. I'm, I'm not positive how much I made. I think I made maybe 20 grand off of wholesaling the house. I wholesaled it to a builder in the uh, Doylestown area, and he took it right away, fixed it up to the nines, and <clears throat> made it a, a perfect house. So I made 20 grand off of this deal, but the second part was he couldn't afford to buy the condo in Hampton Crossings. So I went on the MLS and I looked, and six properties came up on the MLS that were available for sale in Hampton Crossings. So I called each and every one of the realtors. Realtors don't understand the kind of things that we're teaching here because their brokers don't teach them that. I'm not saying it's impossible 
that a realtor would understand the strategies that we use. But generally speaking, they don't understand them. They don't use them. They just want to work with buyers and sellers and get their 3% commission or two and a half or whatever they get, right? So I decided to call all six real estate agents. I called all six of them. Five of them said, you yeah, sure, you can buy the unit if you want to, but that's it. And I'm, I'm, I'm looking to get some kind of creative deal, right? So this one realtor, it was like somewhere in the middle of the pack, this one realtor says, I can't make that decision for the seller, but I can put you in touch with him. Awesome. That's what a real estate investor always wants. We don't want to be talking to the agent. We want to be talking to the seller directly. So the seller gets on the phone. <clears throat> His mother had passed. And I said, what if I told him about uh, subject two and the fact that I could make payments on his mom's loan, right? <clears throat> and usually people say, well, won't that destroy my credit? But mom's dead. She doesn't need her credit anymore. I can't damage her credit. I mean, and even if I didn't pay the loan, uh, mom won't complain, right? So this is an arrangement where it's super easy. The guy said, there, there was some structural damage on the second floor of the property. There was a beam that was broken. Uh, but I sold it to the people and just told them that this beam was broken. And it was a second floor unit. And they looked at it and said, great. So the arrangement with these people was I did a lease option with them. I said, so here's the deal. I own the condo. I'm going to do a lease option with you, right? The f if you buy it in the first year, it's going to cost, I think it was 90 grand. If you buy it in the second year, it's 115. You buy it in the third year, it's 130. If you don't buy it <clears throat> by the end of the third year, well, I'm just keeping it, right? So I was trying to put some pressure on them to get their act together and buy it. So if you go back to the beginning of the story, the husband had had a heart attack. He was driving around and... Uh, Bucks County has this uh, company where they uh, pick up people and take them to doctors. I don't know what the name of that company is. Does anybody know what it is? County, tra maybe that's what it's, it's, it's Bucks County Transportation. They, they help elderly people, they give them rides. This guy was a driver for them. So um, he finally moves into this condo with his wife and like three weeks later he has a real heart attack and dies, right? But the wife, so unfortunately, the father died. That's the bad part of the story. The good part of the story was the wife was a nurse, and she had she made a lot of money. I think she had like an $85,000 a year salary. And she ultimately bought the house in the second year, right? And, and the husband's biggest concern, he, he told me, his biggest concern was after he had the initial heart attack, his, his biggest concern was he was going to die and his wife was going to be stuck living in that house. Right, because it needed like a hundred grand in work, easy, maybe one hundred fifty. <clears throat> so I made another ten grand off the condo when she bought it. Right, my truck cost thirty thousand dollars to buy, not this truck, the uh, a Nissan truck that I bought brand new, it cost thirty grand plus tax and tags. Well, I made thirty grand off of these two deals. Right. It didn't come off the t-shirt, but it came off the car, came off the truck. So you should wrap your trucks. You should wear t-shirts. You should scream to the world what you do for a living. Sure, you need a mic to ask a question so they can hear you on Zoom. Um, thanks for taking my question. Uh, I don't want to open up a can of worms, and if it's not the right time, what, what did you mean by the guy saying, <laughs> Um, won't that destroy my credit? And um, and then the other thing I wanted to ask you about, and if it's not the right time, that's fine too, but I'm curious about the 988-2000. Did you purposely do that? Was that select, luckily selected? Or? I own that phone number. I own hundreds of phone numbers. How do, you, do you know how to get bandit? Are they called bandit numbers? No. No, you're thinking of bandit signs. Oh, right, 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 right. I'm sorry. So right. How, how do you... How do you uh, you know, if it's not the time, that's I own an office building, and when 
and the office building provides phone numbers. We have 47 offices in it. I'm going to actually talk about that deal tonight. When I bought the office building, I got 200 phone numbers with it. So I took the best phone number, the easiest phone number to remember, and made it mine. And my tenants get phone numbers too, but not, they're not, not with the 2,000 on. There's, those are not easy to get. <laughs> I, I want to get 1-800 clean before uh, Don does, you know? <laughs> well, you gotta, what you got to do if you want to get a great phone number is you got to figure out an exchange that you really want, okay? My business partner got himself a lot of great phone numbers, but it was with hard work. It was hours of calling uh, phone companies and trying to negotiate to get good numbers. Like he's got uh, 321 sold, which is a good number for people who are trying to buy houses, right? Or sell houses, right? Uh, so that's how I got that number. It's on my car. It's on my building. Uh, this is my I Buy Houses store. All right. Hey, Mike, you might need to change the slide for me. The clicker's giving me problems. What's that? The concern of uh, destroying the credit with the subject two. I, I, it's a little complicated of a topic. I'm going to get into that with the second presentation, okay? So I'm speaking for two hours tonight, so I'll be able to answer your question at some point. So this presentation is called Multiple Deals of a Lifetime in Only Half a Life. That's right. I'm only halfway through my life, <laughs> right? So I bought this building in 2006. And um, I had actually taken my real estate exam in this building uh, when, before I even knew it was for sale, before I even knew I was going to be the owner of it. And uh, frankly, the building is like a maze, and I, I got lost in there. But I did find a bagel in the kitchen. And I didn't see no signs of anything, so I took it. And I toasted it, and I put some cream cheese on it, and then I ate it, right? <laughs> then about a year later, I happened to be looking on the MLS, and here's the building for sale for $2.3 million. And I thought, well, what the hell? Let's give it a try. I only had $10,000 in the bank, right? That's all the actual cash I had. Now, I had a bunch of houses in Philadelphia. Back in the day, I mean, it might have been the number of all the houses I had. It might have been 23 houses. A lot of them were in Mayfair, Parkwood, Morrell. I had one in South Philly. So they were kind of spread out all over the place. And so although I didn't have any more money than I was only liquid for $10,000, I had all these houses, right? So I went down to the building. Let me just back up for a second. Three years prior to buying this building, I bought the building in 2006. But three years prior to buying this building, I was doing something that I call calling the signs, okay? So we drive up and down roads all day long, and you're always driving by large buildings. And in front of these large buildings is usually a big sign that says, for sale, for rent, right? And a phone number. So I decided, how am I going to learn about the commercial business? I know. I'm going to call the signs. So I started calling signs, two or three a week. And I would book appointments with these people. Now, sometimes there was a realtor there. Sometimes there was a seller. Sometimes they both were there. And I would walk in, and the real estate agent would say, this building has a wonderful cam. This cam is really good. And I'm thinking, what the hell is a cam? I don't know, right? But I got him to explain it to me, right? And then the next time I went to a different building, I'd say, how's your cam? <laughs> right? This is how I learned the business. I just, it's, it's, just, it's just another way of, there's about six different ways to value a commercial building in a quick calculation. There's something called the 10 times valuation calculation. There's something called a cap rate, which is probably the one you should be using. And then there's a CAM. And then there's also um, 
uh, gross rent multipliers, there's about five or six different equations that you could use, right? For, the, for my purposes at this point, you just look at the rent roll, you figure out the price that they're asking for, and you try to make sense of it all, right? So anyway, so I go to, so three years prior to buying this building, I had been calling the signs. And this is how I was educating myself on how to buy commercial real estate. When I got in to ultimately meet the sellers um, and their two real estate agents, two realtors, there was a company called Marcus and Millichap. Anybody ever heard of them? You have? Okay. They're commercial realtors. And they usually work in teams. So they got a senior realtor and the junior realtor, the two of them together, were earning $130,000 in commission on a $2.3 million building for sale, right? Okay. They got to pay a piece of that back to their broker, and I'm sure the junior wasn't getting the lion's share of that money. But anyway, so I ultimately go in there and I get the property under contract using a, uh, back then I was using like par agreements, not my, not my beautiful two page contract. That's all I use now, but I got it under contract, right? Now, here's the most ridiculous thing you can't, I can, still can't believe happened to me. These two realtors and the two sellers who were experienced real estate investors, nobody asked me to show them the money. They allowed me to lock up the building for 90 days with a par agreement and never asked me to show them 10 cents. I had 10 grand in the bank, right? So I go home, I'm so proud of myself, right? <laughs> I go home and I, 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 I'm like, okay, let's see what can happen next, right? If they had just said, um, <clears throat> Phil, you seem to be an interesting guy. But in order to buy this building, you would need approximately $475,000 down. We would like to see that money before we allow you to sign the contract. Don't ever forget that. If any of you, I know you're a realtor and a broker, right? Can you imagine if one of your agents did that? <laughs> I mean, insane. What? It's a major, major mistake. So. Anyone is trying to buy a property that you own and you're selling it yourself, which you're allowed to do, right? Or if you become a realtor one day, you never, ever let somebody take the property unless they show you the, the money, okay? They, they, this was from a big... The way this firm works is you have to work for free for the first six months, right, as a junior agent. And you work under the umbrella of the senior agent. That's how it works. So there's two agents, but their combined com commission was 130 grand. They should have gotten about $13. That's what they should have got, right? Right? So, because they let me just hustle them, okay? Right? So anyway, I go home. What the hell am I gonna do? Well, I don't have any money except 10 grand, but I do have a bunch of houses, right? And I am a real estate agent. So I immediately put up eight of my houses for sale in one night. I remember being up until like three o'clock in the morning, right? Uh, and I put eight of my houses up for sale and I got a little lucky. In fact, I get lucky a lot. I almost count on it. I'm so lucky. A lot of good things happen to me in my life. I don't know why. Maybe somebody up there likes me, right? So I put a eight of my houses for sale, and four of them sold within a pretty quick time frame, like six weeks, seven weeks maybe it took for four of them to sell. And out of the four houses, they all made approximately about $100,000. I didn't put up houses that had 15 grand in equity in them, right? That's not going to help me. I need $475,000, right? So I put up eight houses for sale, Four of them sold, all giving me approximately $100,000 from the four houses. So I'm still significantly short, right? 
I've now, I haven't settled all four of my houses yet, but I, I'm counting on that money coming through. I'm counting that those deals are going to work. So at this point, I'm still uh, $75,000 sure. No, I'm $65,000 sure because I got ten grand in the bank, right? It occurs to me, because I had bought duplexes before. Now, when you buy a duplex, whatever security deposit and last month's rent is collected by the landlord, if I become the new landlord and the tenants remain, the leases come to me, the last month's rent comes to me, and so does the security deposit, right? Well, this building, Executech Suites, had a rent roll of $42,000 a month. 500 grand a year. $42,000 a month times 12. It, ma it was making $500,000 a year. So I called up the title company and I said, hey, um, this is Phil, I'm the guy buying the building. Back then I wasn't as experienced as I am now. And I said, I know, like, when you buy a duplex, you get that last month's rent and a security deposit. I said, will that come to me at settlement? He said, Shh, yeah, absolutely, that'll come to you. And I said, well, what I really mean to ask you is, can that come to me before settlement so I use that money as my money, <laughs> down money? He goes, it's coming to you anyway, so I don't care. I'm like, great. So all of a sudden... I just found $400,000. So it wasn't even my money. Now, you're supposed to put that money. Yeah. Okay. So I've had judges tell me this. I've had real estate agents tell me this. I've been in the business since 1989. It's 33 years. I have never heard of even a single person going to real estate prison because they didn't put someone's security deposit in an escrow account. Now, is that what you're supposed to do? Yeah, that's what you're supposed to do. Do I do it? Yeah, I ain't never done it. Never. Okay, never. All right? And in this case, I just used the money. So now I got 400 grand plus the 10, I got 410,000. The security deposits and the last month's rent totaled to $60,000. All I had to do was come up with $5,000 more and I bought this building. I, this building, I bought it in 2006. Hey, Mike, I'm going to need your help. This clicker is... No. Okay, so I bought this building in 2006. This is just a picture of, you know, the uh, a drone picture of the building. Uh, there's 47 offices in this building. And my wife took it over. And my daughter runs it, so it's a family operation. Right? I go in there and do things from time to time, things that they don't know how to do. But uh, as every year goes on, my involvement becomes less and less. Right? My wife wanted me to uh, let her take over the building. She's a pretty clever businesswoman in her own right. She's tough on people and collect the rent and does what's necessary. So... Um, my wife and my daughter now run this building since 2000, and they kicked me out of there around 2008. So it's a funny story. My wife says to me, um, she goes, Phil, do you like working with me? I said, yeah, yeah, I, I love working with you. She goes, well, I don't like working with you. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, uh, well, but I've been running this building for two years. What, what do you mean? She goes, look, you got all these ideas, you got all these things you, you want to do. She goes, just, just leave. Let me run the place. She goes, she did work with me for the first two years. She, she, she quit her job as a nurse and come, came to help me. And the only thing that we had for her, her to do and kind of learn the building was just getting her in the damn building was the first thing. Get her in the building. But she ended up like having to answer the phones a lot. We answer the phones for all of our tenants. So if you had a business, so let's just say ABC, uh, if Pete has a business, ABC Public Adjusters, they'd answer the phone. ABC Public Adjusters, oh, you, uh, uh, would you like to talk to Peter? Let me transfer the call to him. And 
What? PB. PB. Okay. So that's the name of your company? PB Public Adjusters? Okay. Okay. So they would answer the phone in the name of your company, whatever you told us to answer it by. And when a phone call comes in for you, for your phone number, a screen pops up and gives the receptionist all the details about who, how many people are working that company. She can transfer the call to anyone in that company, right? So it's just another service that we provide for people. And uh, you could be at home sleeping on a couch, but you get a phone call on your cell and your clients don't know that you're not in the office. They called the office number. We just transferred it to you, right? So it's a way of providing professional services for businesses, making them look good to their clients, right? When you call, you get your client. I don't know about you. I got an HVAC guy. I call him and he never answers his damn cell phone. He never answers his house phone. I stopped using him because I want, I want, I need somebody. If, if my office, one of my offices, the air conditioner is not working and it's the summertime, that's a serious problem for me. I can't have that. I need the guy to help me, right? So getting people on the phone is important. So uh, show you some more pictures of this if I can. Yeah, yeah, sure. Were they desperate? No. You know what they were doing? They were... I'll let you in on a little secret. When people screw up in life, it's usually because they're getting greedy. So these people decided to dump their portfolio, this building and other buildings. They showed me plans of a project that they were building or about to be building in Costa Rica. They tried, they saw me as someone that was rich. They didn't realize I didn't even have enough money to buy the damn building I was buying off of them, right? Right? And I hadn't bought it yet at this point. They were already trying to get me involved in this other project in Costa Rica. They bought all this ground they were going to build a country club, mansions. The damn place didn't even have roads. It didn't have electricity, and it was infested with monkeys. I shit you not. It was infested with monkeys, okay? There were monkeys everywhere. They showed me pictures of the monkeys, it's like in the trees, on television. They were everywhere, right? There are no roads. What are you going to do with these monkeys? You gonna go around and have somebody shoot monkeys? I mean, I don't want to be a part of that, right? This is crazy stuff. They were showing me that they're gonna build like million dollar homes in Costa Rica. And all I kept hearing was it's right near the four seasons. Like that means anything to me. I never been to Costa Rica, still haven't been there, right? Um, make a long story short, they lost everything. Everything, they went bankrupt. And let me tell you something. I don't want to get into the details of these two individuals who sold me this building, but they were not good people, wow. right? Uh, the longer I got to know them, the list of people who would come talk to me about their shady dealings. Yeah. So anyway, well, good for you. this is the front of the building. Um, when I first bought, I bought it in 2006 and I immediately went to work landscaping, pavers, anything I could do. This is my daughter who still works the front desk. She opens the building, she closes the building. Uh, this is one of our conference rooms. Uh, this is our kitchen, which actually we're getting ready to redo it now because we did it back in 2008. Uh, there's my wife, she sits in the office and closes all the deals. When people come to my office building and they want to rent space, my wife gives them a tour, shows them the offices. Some of our offices are only $495 a month but they're great offices for people who are starting new businesses like a cleaning business. And you need to have like a professional address. If, if someone gives me their business card, this is just me, doesn't mean everybody does this, but if someone gives me a business card, the first thing I do is I look up their address. So I wanna see like, do these people like, are they working out of their house? Which I don't really have a problem with that. It depends on what kind of business it is. You, a lot of businesses you can run out of your house. I work out of my house, right? But 
if you look it up and you see a big office building, it sort of makes you go, huh, this guy's a real company, right? It does give some legitimacy to it, it does. Yeah, so this is one of our biggest offices. Uh, it's an IT company. They do websites, all kinds of cool stuff. They're good people. I call this presentation multiple deals of a lifetime, okay? In only half a life, right? Because this is one of the killer deals I put together just by bullshitting them. And I'm lucky they didn't ask, ask me that one question. Because if they had just said, do you have $475,000? I'd have been dead in the water. Done. Right? Okay. So I consider this like a deal of a lifetime. This building has been feeding my family since 2006. I absolutely love this building. I would... Anything that they need from me, I go down there and do. I, I, one of the things I do is, if the roof, the roof is a flat roof. Flat roofs, it has a very gradual, like, couple of degrees on the slope, right? So you might get a roof leak somewhere on a building like that. It's a big building, right? So it's got a lot of roof. When, it, when there's a leak... The roofer can't go up on a roof and find it because it's too damn big of a roof. So I have to figure out where it is in the building and then I have to go on the roof with the roofer to show him the approximate area where I saw the leak. So I get, I get to go up on the roof a lot. <laughs> Not a lot, but let's just say six times a year I'm, I'm up on the roof, right? That's just something that happens. It's something I got to do. I can't have my wife go up on a roof. She's not going to do that, right? There's a telephone system in this building where I provide telephone numbers for all my tenants, right? And uh, sometimes people have unusual requests. They want 800 numbers. They want, they want uh, different kinds of things in their offices. You got to hook them up with what they need. So I had to become a telephone guy prior to owning this building. I didn't know a damn thing about telephones, right? Now I can, I can wire and tap into anybody's phone I want. I'm kidding about that, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, let's go to another. Uh, this is the mailboxes here. We have a mailbox area for everybody where they put their business cards on it so everybody knows who else is in the business and people do business with each other. It's nice. We got a copy machine for you. And now let's talk about another deal of a lifetime. We call it Tiny House Siesta because it's in Siesta Key. This is the Tiny House Park. And I want to tell you the story of how this deal went down because a lot of newbies think that they need to know all of these things before you can actually buy properties, right? And I'm here to tell you that's not true, right? You need to have, like, guts and you need to just be a people person and talk to people and get people to like you and ask questions. Anybody can do that, right? If you're not brave enough for that, you need to kind of work on that and develop that skill of meeting new people and being genuinely interested in their property and asking them lots of questions. Because if you ask them lots of questions, they will begin to reveal to you the problems that the place has that you can then use to possibly lower the price or negotiate a better circumstance for yourself in one way or another. So when I first went to this mobile home park, this was a crappy mobile home park like anyone you've ever seen. Most mobile home parks are not attractive, okay? This place was pretty much a dump, but it had 17 trailers on it, and it was located very close, less than, less than one mile, uh, 0.73 miles away from the number one rated beach in the United States, which is Siesta Key, Florida. If you've never been there, you should book a vacation at a tiny house siesta, right? Or I got a bunch of other houses there, too. I got four-bedroom houses. I've got some smaller ones that are much more affordable. So I got a combination of a bunch of different things. I own a couple of duplexes there that you could stay in. 
that are really close to the beach, very comfortable. Anyway, so I get this, I go, so here's how this happened. My mother-in-law, my wife and I go to Florida and my mother-in-law comes with us. And on this trip, my mother-in-law says, Phil, I had a very romantic weekend in Siesta Key in 1980s. In the 1980s. She says, could you take me around to the best westerns in Sarasota? I want to see the, the place where I had my romantic weekend. So I take her to... There's, I go on Google, there's only four hotels. I take her to go see these four hotels. She says, that's not it, that's not it, that's not it, and number four is not it either. And I'm like, but there ain't no more. That's Western there. Maybe there was another one, I don't know, and it became something else, I don't know. So I'm getting a little frustrated by this point, and I happen to see a FISBO sign. For sale by owner. If you're a real estate investor and you see a for sale by owner, you damn sure better go take a picture of that sign. At the very least, take a picture of it and call them tomorrow if you want to, or call them right now. You should call them, okay? <clears throat> All I saw was a piece of junk trailer with a FISBO sign out front that said for sale by owner. I called the guy. He answered the phone. Do you know who Gallagher is, the comedian from the 1980s? You, you, you probably have to be a little bit on the older side to know that. He smashes watermelons with sledgehammers, right? His brother answered the phone. He goes by, he is also a comedian. He goes by the name Gallagher 2. Gallagher 2 is a very cool guy. I like him a whole bunch, okay? So I met him, I called the number, he's the one who answered. So I made an appointment to come back the next morning, because I was staying right there in Siesta Key. I came back the next morning, and I started talking to the guy. And he was walking around saying, I hate this place. I freaking hate this place. I hate this mobile home park. I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. And I'm looking around, thinking to myself, what? the hell is he talking about? First of all, all the homes that were in there, all 17 of them, were owned by the individual people living in them, which means that the landlord doesn't have to fix anything because I don't own it. So all I was doing, all he was doing, was allowing them to park their trailers there. What was his responsibility? Collect the rent and cut the grass. And you don't even need to cut the grass in Florida because there's like a million landscapers in Florida. If you stood on a major intersection, I promise you that five landscapers would drive by in 10 minutes, right? And they all got numbers on their trucks and everything. People fire and hire new landscapers like more than they change their underwear, all right? This happens all the time. Yes, Paul? Do they also wear I am a landscaper t-shirts? <laughs> no, but they should. They should. So this park was trashed, right? So listen to this part, because this is important. We start negotiating with the guy. He names the price, Gallagher 2, he names the price at $917,000. Don't ask me why he picked that number. He just picked it. I was fine, I was fine with it, okay? Mobile home parks... It was probably worth more than that even at that time, okay, in 2016 when I bought it. He says to me, I want to get the heck away from this place because he hates it so much. He says, so we suggested, I, in the conversation he mentioned that he wanted to travel around the United States with his wife, right? And he kept saying, I'm 65 years old, I don't have that long to live. I'm thinking you're 65, I mean, come on, like eat some vegetables, dude. You know, like go to the gym maybe once or twice. You probably could live a little longer, right? Um, we suggested to him, me and my business partner, what if we pay you 
out over 20 years. Now, this is known as seller financing. What was ultimately negotiated was <clears throat> he wanted $200,000 down because he had, I think he had a $150,000 loan on the property. So he wanted to put fifty grand in his pocket, and the, and the rest of the deal was, it's like, I think it's like five and a quarter percent interest or something. So five and a quarter percent interest on the money, <clears throat> and the payment was $5,200 a month. Well, it might sound like a lot to you, but this park was providing already $10,000 a month. It was making $10,000 a month the day we bought it. So we already had the payment right there. Right? We were collecting two payments a month, and we hadn't even started fixing it up. Right? Over the course, so the deal was $5,200 a month, went to Gallagher too. This is known as seller financing. He is the note holder. He didn't... We gave him money, we gave him $200,000, and then agreed to pay $5,200 a month, right, for 20 years. And there's also this caveat in the deal that if I, if I sell the park, I have to pay him a penalty of $65,000, right? Unless I substitute collateral, meaning that I give him another equally as valuable property to lean against, okay? So I'm just fine with it. I'm not going to sell this thing for 20 years. What do I care, right? What will this thing be worth by then? I have no idea. A lot more. Let's just say a lot more. So I don't mind being forced to keep this property for 20 years. I got no problem with that at all. So what me and my partner did, first thing we had to do is throw everybody out of the park. We didn't go around and throw everybody out. We threw them out in a timely manner. A couple of people here, a couple of people there. It took a year and a half to get everybody to move out. While we were simultaneously uh, buying the brand new tiny houses. So this part is tricky. Listen how this works. I had an amazing relationship with a private lender back in 2016, he was funding all of my deals, right? I called him up and told him about this deal. He wired me $500,000 with no paperwork, but I already owed him two and a half million at that point. So now I owed him three million, okay? He got paid back. All of it except for there's a little lien on this park that we still owe him, I don't know. Uh, 150 grand or something. It's not a big deal. It's gonna, it'll get whacked out pretty soon. So, out of the 500 grand that this guy gave me, I gave 200,000 to Gallagher too. Signed the contract. We own the park, right? I got 300,000 dollars extra. We used it to go out and buy three brand new tiny homes, and we had them designed to look like the lifeguard stands that are an iconic thing in Siesta Key, Florida. If you've never been there, you probably wouldn't know that. But the, this yellow one, there's a yellow one, there's a red one, there's a blue one, there's a green one, right? And we even tried to position them in the park in the order they are on the beach, okay? So when these first three tiny homes got delivered to this park, we placed them in position, and we started renting them out. Now, how am I going to buy? That's only three homes, right? I still got some cash left over, but this is borrowed money. So I got to make payments on this money every month. You, if, you don't, if you haven't thought about that, if you borrow a bunch of money off of a private lender, you're actually, in the beginning, paying him back with his own money. Okay. Just think about that for a second. Wrap your head around that. Okay. And this guy owed $3 million, but he's cool. He was, he was a part owner of a beach house we had and part owner of another beach house that we had. So he was a happy man, okay? He owned a piece of some of the deals that he'd financed for me, but he did not own a piece of this. He wanted a piece of this, but we wouldn't let him in, right? 
We wouldn't let him in. It's one of the reasons the money kind of dried up after this deal, right? It's okay. You go find money somewhere else, all right? A lot of wealthy people in Siesta Key, Florida. Very wealthy people. Okay. So we've got a little bit of money left, but not a lot, right? What are we going to do? So these three homes show up. We start calling up anybody we know with money and saying, why don't you come look at this home? Would you lend us 50 grand on this home, right? My cousin happens to be a president of a title company. She lives in Englewood, Florida, about 45 minutes south of where Siesta Key is. She came up. She looked at it. She loved the red tiny house and the yellow one. So she gave us $45,000 for each one. What do we, and then we got someone else to come in and, and give us, lend us money. Keep in mind, we use the cash from the private lender to buy these homes. So these homes have no liens on them. You follow me? They have no liens on them. So then the, my cousin lent on two of them and somebody else lent on the third one. So what do we do with the money? We bought three more tiny homes. And then we just rinsed and repeated the cycle over the course of a year and a half till this all happened, right? Until the whole park got converted into all brand new homes. Not an easy process. This was a lot of hard work. We had to fly to factories that were building these tiny homes and check them out. Because a lot of these guys that build tiny homes, they're freaking ham and eggers. These guys like saw it on TV and said, yeah, let's build tiny homes, right? Some of them... Were, looked beautiful at the factory, but by the time they put it on a bed and drove it all the way to Florida, the damn thing, the doors wouldn't open, the windows wouldn't open, right? The roof separated in one of them six inches, right? I'm like, how the hell am I going to fix that, you know? Tricky stuff. Okay. This is how we finance the place. So let me tell you a little bit about... I. When I first bought it, I wrote a letter to all the tenants telling them that I'm the new owner of the place. My phone started ringing off the wall. What the hell are you going to do? What, are you going to kick me out of here? Are you going to raise the rent? All these negative phone calls. <clears throat> I said, I don't know what I'm going to do with the place. I just bought it three days ago. I don't know. <clears throat> right? So I'm getting all these negative phone calls. All of a sudden, this guy calls me. He says, hey, my name's Jody. I've been living in this park. Would you like me to tell you who all the jackasses are? <laughs> sure, go ahead. He starts telling me, the guy in number one urinates out of his, right out of his door. Guy number two, in number two, he throws car parts all around the trailer, right? Guy number three goes over to the Best Western Hotel that's next door that has a pool and he jumps in their pool, right? Which, by the way, they actually allow you to do now, but back then, I don't think they did. They have a bar outside now, so you can walk over there. So it's like we have a pool at the tiny house park because you just walk across the street, and there's a bar and a pool, and if you're paying money to order sandwiches and drinks and stuff, they're, they're happy to have you, right? So by the time this phone call was done, which was like almost a two-hour phone call, I, at the end, I just said, hey, man, do you want to you wanna manage the park? He's like, sure. And he became the manager of the tiny house park, just like that with one phone call, right? <laughs> right? All these people yelling at me, and then this guy calls me, and, and voila. Because you're lucky. I'm damn lucky. I am. And, you know, maybe, maybe you know, if you... If you're a people person and you treat people the right way, good things happen. This guy was like, oh, you sound like a cool guy. I'm like, you sound like a cool guy. I think I got a bromance with you already. Like, and keep in mind, I just bought this, this park and I, have no, I live in Philadelphia. How the hell am I going to manage this thing, right? Yes, go ahead. So you, you, this was a subject to deal? No, this was no. a seller finance a seller deal. seller finance. So the, the property, the houses were already paid for then. No, the seller got $200,000 down right. with a promise to pay him $5,200 a month for the next 20 years. Okay, so the D is in your name now? Absolutely. Okay. What are you yeah, asking I'll that for? D. You damn know that. I mean, I don't mean to sound green. I just wanted to make sure. Right, come on. You think I'm going to, like, 
give a guy $200,000 unless I control the property? No way, Jose. No way. All right? So I control this property. Now I had to go, and I own all the tiny homes too. So understand, we own the land plus all 17 homes. What's it worth? We have no freaking idea. We can't find anybody who can even appraise tiny houses. And we don't care anyway. We don't care anyway. Executech has never been appraised. I mean, I bought it for $2.1 million in 2006. You would think it's worth at least $3 million. But it's a business. So what it's really valued at is how much money it makes. So if it makes a lot of money, it's valuable. If it doesn't make a lot of money, it's just a bunch of bricks, right? So you have to not only, if you buy real estate like this, you not only have to buy it, you have to make sure it kicks butt. You have to make sure your books are well done and that you can prove to someone that this place makes real money. That is critical. Okay. These are some of the individual houses. We gave them names, the margarita, the siesta, the green lifeguard stand. They're really cute inside. You can see some of these pictures on the bottom, but they're kind of kind of small. Um, the sand dollar, the red lifeguard stand, the flamingo. We got a professional photographer who takes pictures of these things. Uh, anybody here a photographer? Anybody? Okay. So... Uh, there's some acronym for this camera that he uses, which is a special camera. I'm not going to get into it. I just was wondering if anybody knew. So it's it's not that. It's way more complex than that. Right. So uh, these are just some of the houses. A lot of thought, a lot of work went into these things. Uh, decking them all out, furnishing them, being like so careful about every single thing that you put in there to make it look super cool. And the people who go to these things, the reaction that they have, it's, it's pretty amazing. You know, I've seen people come out of the home shaking like this. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. You know, people who love tiny homes, they, they book this place like crazy. So, Phil, I realize those trailers, they still have wheels on them. Are they actually car make trailers? You have to leave the wheels on them under the, under the rules of this particular uh this particular park so it's probably just a base with wheels and then you use wood to build up or is it a car no the made? wheels are holding up the trailer no follow me a car mate trailer you can put a car in. i have one at home because i need an office and i was thinking that i could probably make an office out of that car mate trailer that i have that's big enough for a car to fit in you probably could so I'm looking at Here, I couldn't take the axles off. Actually, uh, a guy who was in the mobile home parks, he had a mobile home park, like, supply center. He offered to give me, I think it was, I can't remember what he offered. It was, a, I think it was $1,000 per axle for every axle we had there. And we got three on every trailer times 17. So it would have been some yeah, nice got, money. I got a three But axle the trailer. township... Uh, required me to keep it on wheels. I don't know why. I don't know. I don't argue with them. Yeah. Okay. These are, yeah, sure. Just out of curiosity, like in Florida or how, how does the property work? Like I was seeing concrete slabs and things like that. Like do you have to draw permits to, you know, like where I live in New Jersey, just to put a shed up, you have to pay absorbent amount of money. You live in New Jersey? Survey. <laughs> My condolences. I know it might sound frivolous and no, silly, not. but... No, it's not. It's a good know. question. In certain states, they make you put a slab down. Illinois makes you put a slab down. Every home's got to have a concrete slab, okay? But that's Illinois. Florida has something called freedom, which you don't experience in New Jersey. Not that often, at least, right? In Florida, you can put a... Okay, in Florida, if you want to evict a tenant in a mobile home park, you tape a three-day notice to vacate on their door. I mean, that doesn't mean they're going to leave in three days, okay? And I don't even necessarily want them to leave in three days. I just want them to know that I want them to get the hell out of here, okay? And I probably had a reason for doing that. But I had to do it with all 17 of the original people. Uh, otherwise, I couldn't have brought in all these tiny homes. But I did it over a year and a half. 
And obviously, the people who were there at the second half knew that they were getting kicked out eventually. And I kept saying, maybe you should start looking at some other mobile home parks. Obviously, all the houses are leaving. You probably noticed that, right? So this is just a couple of books I wrote, uh, How to Buy Houses and None of Your Own Money. I actually was watching a TV show with Carlton Sheets as the speaker. Anybody remember him? Yeah. Right? And I was watching it with my mom. It was like an infomercial. And I watched my mom, and at the end of the commercial, my mom said, well, what do you think, Phil? Do you think people can buy houses with none of their own money? I said, how the hell should I know? I'm nine years old. <laughs> right? <clears throat> Funny that that happened, and I said that, and then I ultimately ended up writing a book on how to buy houses and none of your own money. I find it comical. Okay. We could go to the next presentation. Now I'm going to explain to you about some strategies. I'm going to be throwing a lot of stuff at you. But what time do we break up here tonight? Nine? Yeah, okay. Okay. All right. So this is uh, my I Buy Houses store, as you've already seen. This here, I had come here one night when we first opened this school, and it occurred to me as I sat in the back drinking a cup of coffee, I don't have a presentation for tonight. So I pulled out a piece of loose leaf paper. I know this business. I've been in this business for 33 years, okay? I pulled out this piece of paper, and I started writing this list. This is a list of, of just some of the most basic ways you can buy houses. There are others, but the others get, uh, we're getting into the weeds a little too deep, if you know what I mean, okay? So you can take a picture of that if you're interested in, in uh any one of these TVs, you can just take a picture. Okay. So my favorite way to buy houses is to buy houses and keep them. I know of no better way to get wealthy than that. All you have to do is buy a bunch of properties and focus on your health so that you're still alive to enjoy the value that your properties will provide for you and the rent that your properties will provide for you. I absolutely love real estate. I'm addicted to real estate. My book is called Addicted to Real Estate. My brokerage is called Addicted to Real Estate. I now hang my license at the investor brokerage, but uh, Addicted to Real Estate is still a, a operational uh, real estate agency in um, uh, Hilltown on 309 right where um, County Line Road dead ends, okay? So if you know that area, it's right on 309. And uh, you'll see trucks and trailers with the same logos that I got on my I Buy Houses store. Okay, so these are some of the strategies. Let's go through them one at a time. So this is, this, this is a chart of just some of the things that you get with a house, okay? You get security, so you... You have a place to live. You have a roof over your head. Your, your, your family, people you care about, your children, your mother-in-law, whoever you allow into your house, you have security. That's the most wonderful thing about real estate, right? What else do you get with it? Well, you get tax benefits, okay? So you're allowed to write off a fraction of the value of your house as if it's losing money every year called depreciation. I believe the equation is, what, is it 23 years you get to write it off? Do you know, Justin? You get, I think it's 23 years. 27? 27 and a half. 27 and a half, you're right. So the government, don't ask me why they do this, because everybody knows that real estate mostly goes up. If someone says real estate goes up all the time, make sure you correct them, because it doesn't. It does come down. You get to, so if your house, if you paid 500 grand for your house, you could write off 127th and a half of your house's value every single year till you value it down to zero. 
That's called depreciation. That's one of your greatest tax benefits in real estate, okay? What else do you get from it? If you, if you use the house, you get the use of the house. You get to enjoy the house. But let's just suppose that you're a savvy real estate investor after coming to investor schooling, and now you're going to get yourself two or three more houses. You may not choose to use this one. You may want to use another one that you bought. You might like that better. So now you can rent this out, and you're going to get an income stream from it. It's basically cash flow for you. It comes directly to you. You're going to rent the property for more money than you, your mortgage is and your taxes and your insurance, all that together. You're going to rent it for more, and you're going to get an income stream from it. And that's your money. You can do whatever you want with it. It's not tied to the house. You can do whatever you want. You can also enjoy the growth of real estate because real estate mostly goes up over time. You need to give it time. Now, right now, we're in somewhat of a, a correction with real estate where the prices are coming down in Florida and Pennsylvania, not tremendously, but they're, they're starting to show chinks in the armor that the prices are going to come down a little bit. What does that mean? I mean, to me, it doesn't mean anything because I don't care. I'll ride it down and ride it back up again. I've done it enough times by now. In 33 years, I've done it enough times. But if you do get some growth, that's another way to provide money for yourselves. You could call up a bank and say, hey, my house on Zillow is valued at X. I didn't think it was worth that much. Could I get a home equity line of credit secured against my rental property or my primary residence? You're better off doing it on your primary residence because that's the place you're going to get the most possible amount of money from. Banks are very comfortable lending on primary residences because most people pay their primary residence mortgage. Even if you had three other properties or 10 other properties, the bank would still want to lend on your primary residence first because no one's not going to pay the loan on the house they live in unless they absolutely have to, right? If they can't pay it. So you can refi your house. You can sell your house. One of the bad things about it is you have to manage your rental properties. And I hear people have asked me questions like, hey, Phil, I just bought a rental property. Should I hire a manager? My answer is absolutely not. No. Go manage it yourself. Learn how to be a landlord, right? That's a good skill to have. You may want to buy more properties in the future. You need to do it. You need to do it so you learn it. Get Be a people person. Deal with the people and solve their legitimate problems and don't worry so much about their ridiculous problems. You'll, you'll learn that over time, I guess. All right, let's keep going. So one of the, let's get into the quick buying guide, okay? You're probably, especially for some of you newbies, you're going to be thinking along the lines, I, I, I can't contact somebody about buying their house. I mean, I don't have any money. I don't know what to say. Some of you may be thinking like that, okay? And you're right. But you're not going to learn this business unless you try to buy people's houses. If you try to talk to people, you have to try. You, you have to start wearing T-shirts and blasting to the world that you buy houses. Maybe somebody will just ask you if you want to buy their house, right? Which has happened to me, like in the story I told you already, okay? It's not necessarily important that you understand everything. It's important that you ask them questions and let them answer it and begin to understand why are they even talking to you about this, right? And you don't, don't feel like you need to know everything. It's okay. You could say, especially if you're a new student here, you could say, I have some mentors that I'm working with uh, and I would going to be talking to them on Monday night. Could I call you Tuesday and come here with whatever problems you have or, or concerns you have or questions that you have and get those answered so that you can sound more professional on Tuesday, right? Okay, so let's keep going. Um, 
The best way to get rich, long-term, solid plays, okay? Money that comes in your pocket every month. And you want to buy buildings that you're going to be proud to own for the rest of your life. Like, obviously, this is a big building that makes a lot of money. I'm obviously proud of it. It's like a monument to my good decision to buy this building, right? even though these funny stories come with it, right? And I wasn't even qualified to buy it, and I should have never been able to buy it if the realtors did their job. But they didn't do their job, and it's too late now. <laughs> it's mine, baby, right? And I ain't giving it back, okay? And the cash flow from this thing, it goes up and down, okay? It goes up and down. It's 47 offices. You can't keep 47 offices rented all the time. Uh, if somebody left once a month, right? Think about that. So I have 47 offices. Yeah, it, it, it takes four years. If, if one person left, well, whatever. Yeah, you might be right. It's two years. Okay, so the point is, is that it's hard work to keep an office building filled all the time. Right? You constantly have to be marketing. You constantly have to be talking to people. You got to have people who are intelligent like my wife, like my daughter, in the building when somebody walks in and, you, and, and they need to be able to close them and get a contract and get a check. It's, it's sales. You have to do this. So during COVID, did you have to do anything out of your comfort zone to keep this building open? We were absolutely freaking terrified of COVID. Wow. In 2008, we lost five tenants in one day. When the crash of 2008 came around, uh, two title companies and three mortgage companies walked out the door all on the same day. And you still had a mortgage on this building? Of course I still had a mortgage. Freaking mortgage ain't going anywhere. Right? I still, I only owe about a little less than 800 grand on it right now. But I originally borrowed a uh, million nine something, whatever the hell I borrowed. So, um, <laughs> All right. Uh, like twenty-three thousand dollars. Somebody flip flip the page. Okay. I don't know how that page came out. Okay, so let's talk about another kind of strategy: wholesaling. Just giving a quick review of it. When you find an ugly house, somebody that you know, maybe it's an ugly house in an area you don't want to be in, okay? You might have that opinion, but I would tell you, the house is money. We're talking about money. We're not talking about the damn house. We're not talking about the neighborhood. You can buy and sell any damn house anywhere if you know how to do this and you learn how to do this. Wholesaling is the easiest, fastest way to make money in this business. And if you don't believe me, you don't believe me. I can't change your mind other than tell you that again. Okay? Sometimes I get properties. I know I'm, I'm not going to keep these properties. But I still can sell it to somebody else. So I can pull out my two-page contract and get someone to sign that contract. If they sign that contract, at that very instant, I own that property. I have a legal right. I don't own it, but I have a legal right to buy it in so many days. Okay? And that's what you want to do. That's your job as a real estate investor is to lock up a property with my two-page contract. Okay? Larry has one with four pages. I think it's redundant and I think it scares sellers. The more, the more info and pages you put in front of a seller, you scare them. My contract, the only thing they have to fill out is their name, the address of their property, the price they're agreeing to sell it to me, and when we're going to settle on it. Because I often say to somebody, well, maybe I should talk to a lawyer. And I go, what are you going to talk to him about? How much you're selling the house for? Or what your address is? There's, no, there's nothing else to talk about. right? Okay. Anything that you find, it can be a boarded up house. It could be a house that's half burnt to the ground. You can buy that house. All right? And you can take that contract and you could sell it to somebody else. Here's a quick explanation about how that would work, okay? 
Let's just say Pete has a house and it's all boarded up. For whatever reason, he gave up on the house. He doesn't want to be there anymore. He's sick of the house. He hates the neighbors. He hates the house. He hates everything about it, right? Guess who else hates that house? His neighbors. They hate it. If, if they have any self-respect, they hate the way that Pete left the house, okay? I would, I approach any boarded up house that I see and you, you could skip search them and find out who owns it and call them, right? And say, I see your house is boarded up, right? Those are the easiest houses to buy. You can buy those houses for sometimes 10 grand, 15 grand, whatever, right? And now I have something I can sell. I don't know if I'm going to be able to sell it, but it's something I now can legally sell because I have a contract on it, right? So what I would do, Pete signs the contract. I agreed to pay him whatever. Let's pick a number. Uh, I'm going to give Pete 20 grand for the house, right? Now I call up my friend Eric, who I know is a real estate investor. He's an active real estate investor. I know he has money. I know he's an honorable guy. And I'm going to say, hey, would you be interested in, in this particular address? I, I, if he says he wants to go see it, I said, sure. Bring a drill, bring a crowbar, okay? Take the plywood off, go inside the house. There's no lockbox on it because it's already boarded up, right? Right? You could go into the house, bring a drill, bring a crowbar, go into the house, check it out. If you like the house, let me know. So he goes to look at the house and he comes back and says, I like it, right? The house might need 20 grand or 30 grand in repairs. Let's just say it's 40 grand in repairs, right? So it's 40 grand in repairs. Plus, we got to give Pete 20 grand and Phil ain't working for free. So Phil wants 20 grand too, okay? What the hell, okay? Eric likes the house. He wants to buy it, okay? So we got 20 for Pete, 20 for me. That's 40. What did I say the construction was? Another 40. Okay, so we got 80 grand. So Eric is going to show up at settlement. Pete's going to show up at settlement, and I'm going to be at settlement. And we're sitting at the title company, and Pete's going to say, Hey, uh, Phil, uh, I know you. Who's this guy? Right? Who the hell is this guy? And I'm going to say, Oh, this is my business partner. He's Eric. He, uh, he's putting up the money for this deal. Okay? <laughs> What does Pete care? Pete want, agreed to sell his house for 20 grand. He's getting the 20 grand. That's all Pete's got to know about. He asked for 20 grand. He said he was happy with 20 grand. He signed a contract for 20 grand. Pete's getting his 20 grand. Eric doesn't have to explain to him anything. I don't have to explain to Pete anything. We are at this settlement for one purpose and one purpose only, which is to buy your house for 20 grand. You get the 20 grand check. We get the house, okay? We're business partners as far as you know. End of story. That's wholesaling. You could do that with boats, with cars, with houses. The more valuable the thing is, the bigger the spread you can get off of it, okay? Now, normally I wouldn't. Uh, a $20,000 house, I'd probably take five grand on it, right? One time I bought a house for $17,000. I found a buyer to buy it. For twenty-four thousand dollars, and the city knocked the house down before I could have oh. settlement. City knocks houses down, in case you don't know that. In Philadelphia, uh, it's happened to me more than once that I went looking for a house and I couldn't find it. I'm like, no, this has to be the place. I, said, I, I looked on um, on like uh, Google, and I'm like, yeah, the house is here, the park is there. Wait a minute, there's no house there. The city just knocked it down. They just make their mind up and they knock things down. Phil, so I like how you say uh, the buyer of the house you're wholesaling with, he's your business partner. You know, they teach in different in different places that you go through a double closing. You're right. You should say business partner. Otherwise, it could be confused as something else. <laughs> okay. All right. This is a safe, easy way to make money. All you have to have... You have to get a copy of the contract if you're an investor schooling students right on the website, okay? We could talk about wholesaling anytime you want on Monday nights. We can do presentations on it in more depth about it. 
but it's really almost this simple. It really is. And once you've done one or two, you'll just fly with it. Because it's like once you've done it, you're like, I get it. I'm going to do it. Okay. All right. This is a little more sophisticated. Subject two. If you remember the story that I told you about, the guy who had the heart attack, I bought the condo at Hampton Crossing that simply by calling all six real estate agents, five of them said, I don't know what you're talking about. I, I don't know. I can't help you. And then one guy who answered the phone, the one realtor who said, I can put you in touch with the seller. And I told the seller, I said, this is a perfectly legal thing. Your mom's already dead. I can't destroy your mom's credit. So I'm simply asking, can I make payments on your loan, right? On your loan in your mom's name. Is that okay? Would you sell me the house and let me do that? And I believe I gave him some cash, but I, I frankly don't remember how much it was. I might have given him five grand, eight grand. I really don't remember. He might have asked for 15. I, I, I just don't remember. I've do, done too many deals. So basically, if somebody has a huge loan on a house and you can take over the loan payments, and, and the way that we usually teach people how to say it is we say, if I made all the payments on your loan and you'd never have to worry about it again, is that something you would like? Think about how simple that is. I'm not going to say to somebody, um, there's, a, there's a strategy called subject two. And let me explain to you what that means. Here's the definition. Don't get into that. Just say, hey, if I bought this house from you, and gave you the number you wanted, would you allow me to make payments on the loan that's already existing in your mother's name who's now deceased? Maybe you will, maybe you won't, okay? Just ask it like that. Make it so simple, okay? Yes, sir. I got a call from a guy today that says um, he refuses to pay his mortgage anymore. Uh, he lived in like South Carolina. The property's in Trenton. He doesn't want anything to do with it anymore. The property's in Trenton or South Carolina? It's in Trenton. He lives in South okay. Carolina. Okay. So he said, I don't want nothing to do with the house no more. I'm not paying the mortgage on it no more. Is he current? Yes. <sighs> Go take it, take it over subject too. Yeah, I sent him an agreement today, right? But um, What do you mean? You wrote up a contract? Yeah, I used your two-page contract and with, with a uh, purchase price is I, I wrote a $1 subject to the mortgage payment of $550 per month, which is what his uh, monthly payment is. Um, so Well, you need, to put, you need to put the sale price of how much he owes on it. Oh, really? Well, I mean, probably, yeah. Okay. I mean... It's not a lot of space there. Uh, well, how much, how much total does he owe? 54000 54000 I mean, I would just... I mean, I would just make the sale price 54000 Okay. And then if you wanted to in the notes section, I don't think, you know, I'd have to see your contract to tell you if you did anything wrong with it. I mean, keep in mind, there's no rules here. As long as the contract explains what the heck we're doing, okay. right? So if you put 54000 in the sale price, you're saying, I'm going to pay the 54000 Right. Right? Um... I probably would write 54000 in the sale price, and then in the, in the blank section, I would write, I'm going to pay the current mortgage of $550 a month okay. until the loan is paid off. Okay, so also... What does he care? He's walking away from it anyway, right? Right. right. Okay. So who's going to give you a hard time about that? If, if the title company says, you didn't fill this out right, fill it out whatever way they want it to so the damn deal can happen. Okay. Let, let me give you a little warning, though. More and more title companies are saying no to subject to, okay? It's not illegal. It is a totally legal thing. I can prove it to you that it's legal. But you might have a little problem finding a title company to do it. Terra Abstract, my favorite company, will no longer do them. Okay. Now, they might do them for me, but I've done 50, 60 deals there. So they might cut me some slack. I don't know. You need to find a title company that will do it for you. Okay. Maybe somebody here knows one. Anybody? You're going to have to call around. Okay. Uh, Is that because of the mortgage company? If they find out, they can call the mortgage? 
It's because you're violating, um, there's a clause in the mortgage documents that say that, no, that, yeah, it, 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 it's, it's, it's kind of like when a landlord says you're not allowed to have a cat and then one day you turn around and there's a cat in the window when you're at your investment property. What are you going to do? You're going to, you're going to put the cat in jail. You're gonna you're gonna throw your you're gonna throw your tenant out because you can't throw them out. Okay, you can't throw them out. Even if your contract said that they couldn't have a cat, they did it anyway. What are you gonna do about it? You're gonna take it. Is what you're gonna do. You're just gonna forget about the damn cat, and you're gonna move on with your business. All right. Okay. So also, the the guy has like a, a big lien. I mean, he owes the IRS a lot of money. So they put like. Is it secured against his house? Yeah. All right. Well, you well that that's a big problem. So okay. you need to you need to call up a title company that you're going to work with. Okay. Right. Do you know Lexi? Lexi? She could probably help you with it. Wh who is that? I forget the name of our company. Uh, I don't is really it? like go down to Philly to do settlements. I do all mine up here. So uh, look up. For a yeah. You... Look for Lexi on Facebook. Is she in Jersey? No, she's in Philly. She's yeah, in downtown it. Philly. This in Philly. I mean, this in Jersey. Oh, the property's in Jersey. Yeah. All right, I don't know who the hell to tell you to go to. I got a, I got a title company. Okay. It's well, called Sterling. Company, what, do you inform a title company? what do you tell a title company or inform them with this type of situation? I have a, I have a you situation got, First thing he's got to do is he's got to run a title search. you got to run a title search and find out if the loan is secured against the property. And if there is, well... You said it's a big loan. You need to know what that is. He could, you, you, you get the guy to sign the contract anyway. Yeah. Get him to sign the contract. And you already did that, right? Yep. Okay, so you already have a signed contract. So you're in control of the deal now. You just need to find a title company that can run a preliminary title search. That's the first thing you do. Good. You got, a, you got something for us? Yeah. I didn't want to interrupt. Finish your thought. No, please. Uh, uh, all I was going to say is uh, that the first thing you do when you get a property under contract is you, you scan that contract and you send it to your title company immediately and you say, run a preliminary search on this right away. And I expect to hear back from them within like 10 days. Generally, they take longer. So you might not get it for two weeks because they got to rely on the courthouses to, to tell you all the details. Yes, Bill. Okay, so I think I know the answer to the question, but I'm going to say it anyway. What crossed my mind was, what's to stop the people from continuing to put things against the title of this house? But the answer is, it's already the title's changed into your name, so they can no longer take loans against the, the property, right? Sure. When, when, uh, when James takes over the property, he's gonna, I assume he's going to create a trust and he's going to put that property in a trust. And it's no different than he could just put his name on it. He could put it in a trust. I recommend putting it in a trust. I put everything I own in a trust. But he could create an LLC. He could do whatever the hell he wants, whatever he's comfortable with. Now, all the, the rules regarding trust, is that all the same in New Jersey as it is in Pennsylvania? There are some uh, rule changes in certain states. And... I used to know that, but I mostly do all my business in PA in Florida, so I don't really know about Jersey. In fact, I, uh, if you haven't noticed, I'm not a fan of New Jersey. Okay. They make me take my weapons out of my car, even though I have a permit to carry, and I was the third person in the city of Philadelphia to get a permit to carry, and I've never pulled out my gun on anybody. And I've had this permit for like 27 years. I cannot drive into New Jersey with my weapon. It's uh, two years. Two years in prison. Right. <laughs> Fucking insane. What? If I have you stay longer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. I don't want to make things complicated, but prior to him saying that the gentleman... Nobody can hear you. Maybe your mic's not on. All right, so the 
question on in the the theory and I guess the the plan of attack. Yeah, okay. talk right into it. The yeah. plan of it. All right. Yeah, you. Hold it up there. It's an ice cream cone. Talk to it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, don't lick it. <laughs> All right. So, would a subject two be the best route? For a fifty-four thousand dollar deal, so it's a free deal for him. If the loan is only fifty-four thousand and there isn't some massive loan on it, he's buying the house for five hundred and fifty dollars a month until it's paid off. So what? It's a freaking phenomenal deal. It's a free house. So what? What would be uh, the difference between you know beg, borrow, and steal and? Fifty-four thousand, even at a high interest rate, super high interest rate, yeah. and and fi fi fixing it up, and then you know getting it appraised and, and cashing out. Then that if you if you I would no, you're you're just not getting it. Okay, uh, that's this why think, I'm asking. think about this. This is a free house for James. If the if the fifty-four thousand is the only loan on it, James is buying this house for fifty-four thousand. He's going to pay it, but he's paying the existing loan in the name of the old seller. He owns the house now, okay? Once he goes to settlement, he owns the house. He doesn't even need to bring any money to settlement. So you're telling me it's turnkey? It's free. I'm telling you the house is free. Listen to me. I thought it was boarded up. No, no it's a, oh, we're talking about a different deal there. So the boarded up thing was with Pete and with Eric, right? <laughs> now we're talking about James's deal. This guy, the seller is walking away from the deal. He's abandoning the deal. James got it on a contract, so now he has a legal right to buy it. Okay? The guy owes $54,000 on it. We know that much. We don't know what the other lien is. If the other lien is two hundred grand, this deal's dead. Okay? Because it's a house in Trenton, so it ain't worth two hundred fifty grand probably. James can show up at settlement and give them a thousand dollars or something. If you even have to do that, right? As long as the title company will let you do it, a subject to, and and I'm I don't know anyone in Jersey that will let you, but you probably do. So all he has to do is make the payments, and done. He has to make payments at five hundred fifty dollars a month. If I can drag out a loan for twenty years, for ten years, for fifty years, for a hundred years. The longer, the better. Here's a way of thinking about it. I don't want to confuse you. Is there anyone in here who would sell me their home for a million dollars? Raise your hand if you would. Paul. So what's your house approximately worth? Four hundred grand. Okay. I'll give you. I don't have a calculator up here, but let's just say I gave you $1,000 a month for your house until I paid off the million dollars. No, nah, it'd have to be like two or three thousand. That's not, that's too long. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be like 80 right. years. Yeah, right? I'll be, I'll be. My grandchildren are going to still be paying you $1,000 a month to your state when you're dead, right? Because... Yeah. <clears throat> You get the point? Yep. The, if someone will let you make payments on an existing loan that's in place, it doesn't even matter if it was a million dollars. If you control the property for $1,000 a month or $1,500 a month, you can rent that property out to somebody. You can be collecting uh, income stream from a property that you won't pay off for 40 years, 50 years, 30 years, whatever the damn arrangement is, even if it was 20 years, and you had to pay it off in 20 years. In 20 years of owning that house, collecting rental income, you're gonna develop equity in it, it's gonna go up in value, you'll be able to get a loan against it to blow out the rest of the mortgage. So, you get it? Yeah, I get it. Um, but what if it didn't need money? Then what would you do, and you didn't have it? A telephone pole falls in front of a road while you're driving to a house. What are you going to do? 
You're going to find another way to get to the house. Problems were going to come up in every business in the world. This business is not without its problems, okay? We do a lot of crazy stuff that your typical realtor will say, I never heard of that, and I've been an agent for 15 years. Yeah, well, you're not an investor. Most agents own the house that they live in, and that's it. They don't own investment properties. Investors own investment properties. Yes. Well, even if uh, even if you de did need money to fix it up, um, you could probably get another construction loan against it, or you could just refinance the whole thing, or right? You could borrow it off a private lender. Yeah, right. There's a guy in who comes here even with the subject every too. Monday night who lends money professionally. His name is Scott. If you haven't met him, okay, and he's not the only one, okay, all right. There's money available to you. Don't don't create obstacles that don't exist. There will be obstacles, but that's the beauty of this school. Whatever problem, say you, you find a deal next week, and that deal has a problem you don't know how to solve. You come here and you ask us, and the answer, your answer will reveal itself. That's the great thing about this school. That's why so many people come here on a regular basis. So yes, sir. Once you have it on the contract and you're the title search, everything is good. What happens then the rest of the deal? Like the mortgage company knows that you're the owner of the house now? Well, I'm not the owner of the house now. I'm the I'm the owner who has a legal right to buy it. Okay? So let's just say that somebody signed a contract with James and then they changed their mind. Well, James could sue them because they signed a contract saying that they're going to sell the house to James for $54,000, right? So he has legal rights. He could sue the seller for not performing. Oh, and well, and he could also stop the seller from selling the house to somebody else. No, what I'm saying is the deal is done, they're going forward. But what happens next? Do you have to notify the mortgage company that you're making the payments, you're mm -hmm. sending in your name? What, no, what happens? no. You, in a subject to deal, you're not going to, the mortgage company will not like that phone call. So you're not going to call the mortgage company and tell them you're going to do that. What we do is a little more complicated than that. So if James is going to take over this property. The seller is going to make James the property manager. James is now the property manager. Property managers manage properties, right? They cut checks for the monthly payments and they fix things in the house. James is going to be the property manager. So you sign a contract with him as a property manager. You, you don't really have to sign a contract. James can just write a letter saying he's the property manager and he can send that to the bank saying, uh, typically, uh, you, uh, I haven't looked at that form in a while, but it's on the website. Okay, just go to the subject two and look for it. You inform them that you're the property manager. There's yeah. a bunch of forms on there, but you really don't need all of them. You really only need like three or four of them. I think the the form doesn't have a place where they can put in their um, online banking information for the mortgage and uh, so that you can pay it online too, and they can add you and then. Well, you just ask for that. You ask for the uh, website codes. So if they're paying their mortgage on like a Wells Fargo system with a Wells Fargo loan, you ask them to give you the codes and the, 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 the login and the password and even the security questions. And you write all that stuff down, okay? And now you can access the loan directly yourself. So during a subject two deal, I asked for that. Yes, I asked for that benefit. So... Hey, Mike, you back there? Why don't you put up my prop? Well, let me, let me see how many slides I got left there. Okay, so this is seller financing is one of the ways to buy properties. I already explained that in a tiny house park where I'm paying the guy $5,200 a month, okay? You, we're going to have a lot more chance to go over this stuff because this is the kind of stuff we talk about all the time, all right? Short sales. When people are negligent about paying their mortgages, and they get behind in their payments, you can do a short sale where the bank will work with you to get the house for cheaper. 
So this is a good strategy that I use when people are delinquent on their mortgage, okay? You're going to sometimes need money on real estate deals. Private money is private individuals who are going to lend you money. Hard money are professional individuals who will lend you money. And banks stink. Okay, but they lend money if you can get it. If you have a high paying job, you'd probably qualify. If you are a professional real estate investor your whole life and haven't had a job, in 27 years, you might have a little trouble getting money. So I borrow it off of people. I like people better. Go talk to a bank about money. They want uh, a vial of your blood. They want to know every damn thing under the sun. And then they take 47 days to tell you that you're not eligible to get the loan. I'd rather just talk to a guy right in the room, one person, negotiate with one person about, will you lend me money or will you not lend me money? And if not, why? And maybe I'll find somebody else to lend money. So looking for money is something a real estate investor should be doing all the time. And I'll give you a quick tip. All the money you probably will ever need in your life to do real estate deals is inside your cell phone. Everyone that's in your phone, whether it's 2,000 people, you must have spoken to them. Otherwise, they wouldn't be in your phone, right? Does that make sense? Imagine if you just went through your phone. And don't make judgments about, oh, they don't have any money. Don't make judgments like that. Just call people in your phone and go, hey, I'm curious, uh, you know, what do you, what do, you do with your money? Because uh, I'm a real estate investor and, I'm, and I'll pay you 6% interest on your money. Okay? If I said I would pay you 6% interest on your money, are you doing better than that with your... Investments? No. You're, 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 okay, so see how a simple of a conversation that is. My own mother hustled me for two extra points. Okay? So for years, I kept telling my mom, like, I mean, because my mom didn't have a lot of money, but she had money. And I said, how come you're not lending me the money? And she's like, well, you're off, you, you want 6.5%, which is what I was asking for at the time. And she goes, I'm not moving my money for half a point. She goes, but I'll do it for eight. Oh. So I got hustled by my own mom. But she's a tough businesswoman, and she taught me everything I know about business. So I wasn't surprised that she, she hustled me. But uh, I'm proud to tell you, my mom has left this earth, but my father still lives off of that money. My dad has a pension from his job and Social Security, and he gets checks for me every month. So I help my father. Real estate investors can help people, okay? A lot of these scenarios that I talked about today, I, I helped the, the, the guy who had the heart attack so his wife didn't have to live in a dilapidated house. And it was really bad, disgusting, right? Terrible, unfit for human habitation, okay? And you can help people. In the community that I live in, I buy houses where I live. Doesn't that make sense, right? So many houses in the community where I live, I have owned at one point and fixed them up and sold them, okay? So I've helped to make my neighborhood a better looking area and helped make the houses look better and hopefully bring in, you know, quality people who are going to live there and, and become part of the community. So these are things real estate investors can do. Let me show you this deal. This is a house called, I call this a clean and sweep. This is what the house looked like the day I pulled up, all right? I'm running out of time, so I'm going to zip through some of this. This is what it looked like when we were finished, right? I didn't flip it, okay? I took this house. I couldn't even get inside this house. See all the, if you can see it, all these twigs, these are not broken branches. These are the roots from these bushes made like a cage, you couldn't actually walk to the front door without getting hurt, right? I'm wearing sandals and stuff, and I'm like, you know, I saw this house. I got it under contract for 100 grand. I called a tree guy and had him cut down all the trees around the house so you could see the house. And what the heck else did I do? I, I 
had five full-size 40 cubic yard dumpsters come to the house. And we, and we got all the trash out of the house so you could actually walk inside the house freely and see the house, okay? So all I did, I, what did I make off of this house? I can't even remember. $68,000 I made. So I ended up, I bought this house for hundred grand. I sold it to a guy for like $172,000 minus some closing costs. I made $68,000. I didn't do any, I, I helped load the trash into the dumpster. I did that part, okay? Um, lease options, this is a rarely used thing. Flipping homes, everybody knows what that is. Combo deals. When you get fluent with doing the deals, some of these deals, you'll begin to see it in your mind that you can combine these deals. Like sometimes if a guy has a half of a loan, like maybe it's a $200,000 house with a $100,000 loan, you take over the loan subject to, and then you gotta go get private money to fill the void of the money you don't have, okay? So this is something you'll figure out in the future.